there is this uh, typical phrase you have after the introduction you, know, you say um, thank you for this kind introduction you know, everyone said this but I really have to thank you this time for the, let's say the most the best introduction I've ever heard <laughs> <laughs> I speak yeah? so uh, thank you okay. my pleasure and um, yeah so um, I want to do a little I said we heard a lot of things about time perspective today, uh, about time questionnaires, and I want to also speak about time perception, but uh, more in the sense of how we perceive passage of time, how we feel duration, and also try to answer the question, how is it that actually the brain can process this time, and we feel that duration. Um, and these will be questions I'll be asking. So, how do we perceive time? And what is the difference? And that's actually an interesting question that, between time perception and perception of seeing, hearing, smelling. Because we have all these faculties where we have a sense organ, you know, like, like the eyes, we have a representation in the brain, like the visual cortex, and then we have very clear structures and functions of how we process these certain sensory faculties, but not so with time. But still, we talk about time perception, and we actually not only talk about time perception, we, we can really feel subjective time, we can feel passage of time. But how does this happen? And then, of course, uh, related, I will be talking about factors that influence subjective time. Sometimes it speeds up, sometimes uh, it slows down. And uh, at the end, I will also talk about uh, extreme cases, extreme states of maybe where you feel no time. There is no time when the question is this possible. And so my agenda is, first of all, so the structure of my talk will be, I will first talk about uh, the problems in world of time perception, the better already showed uh, this second and Block model, and I will show a little bit about research and applications around this cognitive time perception model. And I, I will also want to make a link to the time perspective, this, these ideas we heard about today a lot, as an individual trait. So, how to connect time perspective as trait with time perception as state. And then I will talk about my own uh, theory of how we come to our feeling of uh, duration of, of our passage of time, and this will be of my theory about embodied time. Yeah? And I will talk about current and historic evidence related to this. And so my uh, like hypothesis is that body signals actually inform us about the passage of time. And then the last chapter I will talk about timelessness and selflessness, about altered states of consciousness, why am I interested in this? Not only because other states of consciousness itself are very interesting to study, if you want to talk about consciousness, to understand consciousness, um, but also because there we have maybe a possibility to actually also understand more how we perceive And so, as a German, my first question will be to the organizers so that I show you a very time aware. Yeah? Um, so, how long do I actually have? Uh, am I allowed to talk? So we have now half past uh, five, <laughs> nearly, 29. Nearly. <laughs> <laughs> nearly. <laughs> nearly. <laughs> nearly. <laughs> nearly. <laughs> 45 minutes. 45 minutes. Okay, so I'll try and so I'll organize my uh, talk around because I could talk longer, but I think 45 minutes should be enough. So first of all, a little background um, of uh, type perception models. And they have an important distinction is Could you be, please speak closely to the microphone? Okay, yes. Thank you. So, the first um, uh, differentiation is retrospective and uh, prospective uh, time perspective. So, retrospective means we're looking back at an interval of time, yeah? and there actually is some sort of clear how this works because it's basically about memory contents and the amount of change. Experiences that define retrospective duration. For example, if you um, think about the last week, how much. <laughs> so, it's on you. Okay, and um, you can, of course, they can also take maybe the mic. No, I don't know. So, I'm sorry, I just want to interrupt the question. Okay, so, uh, retrospective. 
retrospective time perspective. So, for example, how long did your last week last yes. subjectively? Yeah, that's retrospective. We're really looking back at an interval in time. And there, important, as I said, memory contents are important. So, for example, if you had a lot of memory contents, you had a vacation, uh, a horrific vacation where you had a lot of things, different things happening, then subjectively, time stretches. Because you have so much memory of what happened. But let's say in the everyday routine of your daily life, not much happened, every day the same things. When you look back at this time interval, not much really happened, and then time shrinks. So that's retrospective time perspective. But I will talk more about prospective time perspective, perspective because there, a prospective means experiencing at the present moment, but of course, into the future direction of those goals. And very important is attention to time versus <coughs> destruction time. And I will talk about these models and um, we will try to some sort of give an indication of course about how the brain processes this uh, time. So attention time is important versus destruction from time. This is also everyday knowledge. So for example, the waiting time or order, no notice, nothing's happening, we're waiting ending to time and then subjectively time stretches. If we're distracting from time, because we are having a super conversation with someone, we're not aware of time, and then time, the interval of time shrinks, we feel that time has passed in the brain. So this is everyday uh, evidence, and there's actually a model complementing this, and this model is the attention gate model that is the already showed. And I will just focus on the main ingredients of this model, um, where we have a pacemaker that sends our pulses, which are accumulated in this accumulator, and the amount of pulses define subjective duration. So that's why eight seconds feel longer than four seconds, because more pulses are accumulated. But that's important here. Only if we attend to time, which is closed, these pulses accumulate. If we don't attend to time, these pulses don't accumulate, and then time is not felt as being as long. So attention is one of the modulators of subjective time. A second modulator is arousal, because this pacemaker is not always functioning at the same pace or the same speed, but for example, if we are more aroused, the pacemaker is faster, so more impulses are accumulated, and in a arousal situation, subjective time expands. So this is, let's say, the basics of this cognitive model of time perception, and then uh, we try to also uh, do some experiments with this. For example, this was one of my favorite experiments or studies, because we hardly had any or no technology at all, and we had people wait in this room, and we took away all things like cell phones, books, bags, whatever they could uh, need, and had them in this room. And we said to them, they came in for a study, a computer study, and we said to them, please wait here until I come back, because I have to set up the computer in the other room. Then the experimenter went out and left the person there for seven hours. Minutes, 7.5 minutes, exactly the amount of time. The experimenter came back and then asked, So, how long did you think you stayed in this room? How uh, did you feel the passage of time? Uh, how did you feel in general, boredom, emotion, etc.? And um, so you could say this is a um, real waiting time situation under say, uncertainty because the person doesn't know when the experimenter comes back. And so attention to time will go up, arousal levels might go up in individuals, and so we can test actually this model. And in a mediation analysis, with X, M, the moderator, and mediator, and Y, the dependent variable would show that the more impulsive, present-oriented individuals were, the more unpleasant the waiting, and the more attention to time they showed, and then, the longer subjective waiting. So actually, how do we how can we measure this? And this is also why I, I like to be here and, and, and connect with you. Who make, some of you may uh, uh, work more on the time perspective, but I, um, 
asked you to also consider time perception because we have these very strong links between these two domains. So very easily with visual analog scans we can measure, for example, the waiting situation of how often did you think about time between not at all and extremely often the two extreme values. Or how fast did time pass for you? Extremely <coughs> slowly, extremely fast. And then question, how long did the time until the last? So in clock time. So you can also ask that. Subjectively speaking, so we have uh, SAM, which assesses uh, on the one side an upper level balance from I felt negative, some sort of neutral, I felt positive, or how aroused or calm did you feel right now from some sort of uh, very relaxed to aroused. And then you can think about additional other visual analog scales where you think, for example, relaxation. How relaxed do you feel actually? And now going into the details of this uh, waiting time uh, study, um, so we had the trade questionnaire, so you see the impulsiveness scale, the bare impulsiveness. Scale, and then you have the CPI, symbolic scale, with present realistic, present fatalistic, and future. And you see, for example, for duration estimation, the more impulsive people are, the more present oriented they are, the more they estimate uh, duration, the longer they estimate duration. And the other way around, is the future perspective, um, the more future perspective they have, the uh, less long they uh, judge the interval of the The same with the passage of time, so it's the other way around. How fast did time pass for you? So the more impulsive they are, and the faster time passes. Or the same with present realistic, present fatalistic, the more present oriented they are in this negative way, the faster time passes for them. And um, at the slower, sorry, the slower time, time passes. But from a future perspective, the more future-oriented people are, the faster uh, time passes. So we have this nice relationship. The more impulsive present-oriented, the longer judge duration, and the slower passage of time. And the more future-oriented, the shorter judge duration, and the faster passage of time. So this is one example of how you can link trade and state in one uh, study. Another one, another study I want to present you now, that already goes into this field of um, other states of consciousness. And this is the Gansfeld device. So Gansfeld is a German word coined in the 20s and means whole field. And we can stimulate people with a homogeneous green or red or whatever color field. And so it's an unstructured sensory stimulation which can induce other states of consciousness and also additionally they get um, auditory stimulation for example white noise or brown noise brown noise sounds a little like a waterfall and we have people for 25 minutes having these goggles in one color plus the acoustic stimulation and then later ask again the same questions I showed you before about time, about the arousal, the balance about how they felt after the 25 experience of the gut And red is supposed to be more arousal inducing versus green is supposed to be more rela relaxing. And actually this is what uh, we found that the color red led to more arousal subjectively and this more arousal led to a relative overestimation of duration relative to the green condition. So red more arousal and longer longer Okay, so this is um, the first set of a few experiments, studies we did, about how you can, about how you can use um, the cognitive time model uh, with uh, well, different, um, different experiments. But of course we're still on a very psychological level, and the next question would be, can we find um, a way to assess how the brain actually and I want to show you my fMRI research I conducted in uh, San Diego at UCSD, um, where I will show how subjective time and bodily states are related. So here is a, a duration reproduction task. So the classic duration reproduction task is the following. You'll hear or see a stimulus, then there's a pause, then there's a second stimulus, and you are supposed to press a button when you think that the second stimulus
stimulus is now as long as the first stimulus. So you reproduce the duration of the first stimulus by continuing. And there are durations of 3, 9, and 80 seconds, smooth terms, so acoustic stimulation. And we also prevented counting through a secondary memory task. I don't want to go into details here, but I just want to show you how I came to my suggestion that audio signals are important for subjective time. What we found was here in the encoding phase, meaning when they were listening to the first stimulus, that activity in the posterior insular cortex increased over time and it stopped at the end of the interval and went down. So this is the 9 second uh, condition and here's the 18 second condition. So they listened to the tone and only at the end when the tone stopped also this activity uh, went down. So as if the specific brain region, the insula, I will come to in a second to what the insula is about, but this um, brain region codes for duration because the longer duration, the more activity we find. So, what is the insular cortex actually doing? So, just now, just textbook knowledge. So, it's a primary interoceptive cortex uh, which represents the physiological conditions of the body. So, it's important. So, first, hunger, temperature, pain, all our subjective feelings of the body are represented through uh, the insular cortex, the primary uh, interoceptive cortex area. But also emotions are importantly related uh, to the insula because, as we know, for example, from the James Lange theory, and also if you think about Damasio's somatic marker theory, that the interpretation of physiological states is also the basis for complex human emotions. So any emo emotions we have are also, we also have some bodily feelings associated with it. And we have a lot of neuroimaging and lesion studies showing how physiological needs are related to, to the insular emotions, complex decision making, yeah. so it's a pro-verbal gut feeling, yeah. we, we do a complex decision making, but also music perception, which is temporal structure, emotion, on and meditative states, to which I will come later again, is very much related to the So now the next step is we will combine, you know, this funny cognitive model with these boxes and pulses and whatever this was, very abstract. Um, now we can relate this actually to these findings. Maybe what we had before about pacemaker and accumulator is actually the body states, the interceptive signals that are important for coding, accumulating and time. So time is not perceived in the outside world, you can easily say, but through interception by the material needs. So we with our bodies, we are our own or our feeling of passage of time comes through our body design. And if you read a little philosophy, for example, Maurice Bernard Ponty, uh, with his phenomenology, there you have this embodied cognition and also embodied time and here which we also represent it. So you could even say this is some sort of uh, experimental neuroimaging phenomenology, what they have done here. Back to the, the model. Um, so body states, as I said, now. Size. So we have the two modulators. Now it's not just attention to time, because that is the big question. Where do we attend to when we attend to time? We just say, oh, when we attend to time, time expands. Huh? But where do we attend to when we attend to time? Huh? To the body itself, maybe. As for example, in meditative states, in waiting time, where we feel the body very much. But also on the second modulator, to increase bodily arousal of active states again. Feel our body very much, and then again, time expands. So now, doing this, being uh, situated in Freiburg in Germany, um, I can relate actually to someone who is called Hugo Münsterberg, who also resided in uh, Freiburg, but uh, 130 years earlier. So, who is Hugo Münsterberg? He was a student of Wilhelm Bund in Leipzig. And he founded in Freiburg one of the first experimental psychology labs. And then actually by uh, invitation uh, of William James moved to Harvard, where my book was found, by the way. Yeah. Everything is fine. Yes. <laughs> and um, uh, so he produced or wrote this book in 1889. Uh, it's 
published in Freiburg, and his conclusion is that the sense of time relies on the sensation of tension in different organs which are caused by muscle contractions. And how did he come to this? He, did, he had the same duration reproduction study I also used, and um, with duration between 6 and 60 seconds he varied these, and what he showed that the temporary reproductions were most accurate when the onset and offset of these intervals he presented coincided with the breathing in of the subjects. The subjects were not aware of this, of course, but he recorded the breathing in and breathing out. And he found that they were more accurate when the onset of the interval or the offset of the interval coincided with the breathing in. So again, you have this relationship between body and time, already found by Hugo Münsterberg. And so, if you now can see that there's a big, big literature of hundreds of even thousands of studies, and if you want to summarize them, they all point to this relation between emotions, body, and time. For example, in psychophysics, stimuli with emotional content are judged to last longer, they are arousing emotionally. Individuals with high body temperature or fever, they overestimate time. And also, time perception is correlated uh, uh, with heart rate variability. Studies are showing this. So you just record heart rate variability, and it shows that the more var variability in individual subjects, the more accurate people are. And then beginners of meditation, I don't know if you have meditated, I have tried, but I continue because I have so many colleagues who also uh, meditate, but actually you feel very much time as a beginner. You know? Just imagine sitting there 30 minutes doing nothing. What do you feel? You feel your body itself. And time moves very slowly. This changes later in experienced meditators, where then that you lose some sort of sense of time. Let's we'll talk about this a little later. But then also, uh, that's a surprise, effortful, effortful uh, emotional self-regulation. So you're in the flow of time in your everyday life. Everything happens and moves, and time passes quickly. But then suddenly, you stumble, and something surprising happens, and you're in this present moment. You're, you're Regard it, and then uh, you will overestimate also the duration. Uh, okay, in between, uh, while I uh, drink a little water uh, for my homeostasis bodily, there's a little quiz for you. So here is um, a study we did with three different video clips we presented uh, to subjects. We presented them in uh, all together in the sequence one, two, three. Every, of course balance sequence to every subject differently. And we show them Ice Age, so a funny cartoon. We show them a documentary about the city. And we showed them the Blair Witch Project, uh, which is a horror movie. Actually a very exciting, really thrilling uh, horror movie, uh, uh, which induces quite some anxiety. And the question was, what do you think, which of these um, Video clips, all lasting 45 seconds, physically speaking, uh, was judged to be the longest, and which one was judged to be the shortest? What do you think? Which one would be the longest, do you think? The documentary about the city. Documentary about the city, yeah. Huh? The Blair Witch Project. Uh -huh, Blair Witch Project, yeah. yeah. Yeah, this, these are typically the two answers uh, that appear, and there are good reasons why you could predict this. Um, here is now the results. First, uh, look at the gray bars, on the dark bars and gray bars. And you see, estimated time interval is here on the y-axis, and you see that the Blair Witch Project, so the field content, was judged as longest relative to the documentary, the neutral content, Content relative to the cartoon, which is the amusement content. So time flies when you're having fun. Actually, is represented through our study, yeah, because it's nice flowing cartoon, yeah, nothing really, it's a cartoon also, kids' cartoon, and this um, is judged to last uh, the shortest. And then the question of, oh, but the field content more than neutral content, that could be probably anxiety induced arousal system that um, uh, makes this uh, And then we had a second study. Same study with different subjects, but this time we asked them, uh, you have a different subject, this time we asked them, while you're watching, write down what you feel, 
physiologically in your body happen while you're watching. And then you see this is the interceptive focus, the dark parts, that an even stronger effect for the Blair Witch Project and an even stronger effect in the others in the other direction. So, um, I will skip one slide. So, having another um, uh, yeah, um, topic to open up. Remember, we're talking about subject of time, about emotion and uh, bodily feelings. So, in psychopathology, uh, time perception was a very important, um, let's say, area. Of, uh, I am also conducting studies. Is what you find in many patient groups uh, is for patients with depression. Anxiety, uh, also drug dependent uh, individuals in rehabilitation, uh, that people tend to overestimate duration, they feel a slowing down of time, that's actually one of the uh, important uh, symptoms depressed people feel that time does not want to uh, pass, and they feel, or they feel stuck uh, in the present. And also, um, impulsivity as a symptom of psychiatry. Many neurological symptoms, uh, for example, borderline personality disorders, but also with patients with lesion to the orbital frontal cortex have shown that this impulsivity in these patient groups correlates with a relative uh, overestimation of duration. And um, so, this cartoon I want to represent uh, this cartoon, some sort of this overestimation of duration at the present moment is very much exaggerated and the focus of their perception and the future is something far away and here again you, you see a relationship of time perspective and subjective passage of time. So um, this over representation of the present moment leads to a relative overestimation of duration and at the same time the future uh, events are far away and are less represented uh, in uh, the present moment. Um, Talking about neurological um, cases, so there's a one strike. So I'm always interested in archaeological diggings, archaeological findings. Going back, I showed you the Hugo Münsterberg um, study. Now there's also a study uh, where I actually could use my school French, so I could, could actually read it. And this is a study uh, by um, Gabriel de Gros Dallon, a French psychiatrist who worked in at the Saint Anne Hospital in Paris, and he published a paper in 1905 where he had described this individual patient, Alexandrine, who had really a remarkable correlation of symptoms. So, first of all, she had no sense of bodily feelings and urges. How many? She didn't feel hunger, she didn't feel when she was finished with the meals, she did not feel thirst, did not feel to urinate, she did not feel fatigue. And uh, the psychiatrist actually did tests with her. Yeah? Um, a really mean test, for example, you do pour ice water into the ear channel, yeah? and she hardly showed reactions, or with needle pricks, um, he did uh, some tests. Then she reported no emotional feelings. Yeah? So she had um, physiological uh, uh, reactions of emotion, like tears, and we talked about it. The psychiatrist talked to with this about, about the sun with uh, Alexandrine, and she had tears coming out of her eyes, but she said she didn't actually have no feeling. Mm -hmm. And now, importantly, the next step. So, the first type is found some sort of commonly in psychiatric conditions, but there also no sense of time. So, she had a cognitive control of, uh, of time through newspapers, calendars daylight clocks, so she could be exactly at 3 o'clock at an appointment, because she knows how to use the clock, um, uh, but she did not have a feeling of passage of time, and, she, and, and uh, the Gabriel Rodalon made tests with her, showing that she was really off in accuracy of subjective time uh, with different uh, tests. And so he concludes that the duration uh, perceived by consciousness is nothing less than visceral sensibility. We have something resembling internal clocks made up of various physical <coughs> rhythms supplied by signals from our gut, blood, and lungs, arteries, and heart. So 
here again from Münsterberg, we have Gabriel Dallon. Actually, I, could, I won't show now, but also in, with Pavlov, he should have similar um, findings of animals. Uh, it's all clear that the bodily self is related uh, to subject. So the hypothesis of also for the following is that um, self-consciousness and body consciousness are related to time consciousness. So an intensified awareness of ourselves is related to an intensified awareness of time and the other way around. So a weakened uh, awareness of self is related to less awareness of time. State at least, but maybe it would also be interesting to see in trace or works of the time awareness questionnaire that Isabel showed if we also find their correlations. And this is not actually very surprising, but I made a case now with uh, several studies, but also in everyday activity. We showed, for example, in the state of flow, we have this relationship. We're so what is flow, we're absorbed in an activity. It could be we're scripting something on the computer, or we have a stamp collection, or we're playing a music instrument, or whatever we do. So we're so absorbed in our activity that we lose the feeling of self and time. On the other extreme of the spectrum, uh, boredom, waiting time is, of course, a particularly intensive awareness of self and time. Of time. So we sort of have an up and down of self and time feelings during during the day, and this already shows itself. Time are very much uh, related. And this gets more interesting and extreme when we're looking at altered sense of consciousness, where um, time and self are modulated in an extreme way. And very often what you find is that the beginning of some psychological or physiological, pharmacological induction method is that you have some sort of intensified self-experience and the feeling of slowing down of time. And at some point, there's a switch, a flip, and suddenly there's a, what you could call ego dissolution and dissolution of time and also space. I'm not talking too much about, about the relationship between time and space. We heard earlier uh, very much about this relationship. One could also talk about this, but I'll concentrate on, on time. But this is another indication of how subjective time and subjective space are also interrelated. And I will just talk about several examples like meditation, Drugs, psychedelics especially, dance induced trance could be a uh, um, topic, and also hypnosis. Um, I was talking now a lot about self and self awareness, but I think at least now I have to make a little um, distinction of what, what are we talking about actually when we're talking about self. And there you can already from William James, uh, we know that we can talk about a multitude of selves. And also if you talk to uh, philosophers, philosophers today, there is a multitude of selves. You can have social self, emotional self, etc. But I will talk about two main selves, which are most important. One is the sense of body self. I was talking about a lot now earlier. Another word that philosophers like to uh, Say this minimal self, which has something to do with the self-awareness of me here and now, and maybe related also to what related to body things. On the other side, we have the sense of a narrative self, which is a more extended self, a time extended self, where, for example, when we get lost in thoughts, where we have memories of past events or future plans, this is the called the narrative self. And actually, one can actually quite easily also on a neural level distinguish uh, these two systems. So the bodily self, of course, is related to what I showed in the interoceptive system, including insular cortex. And uh, on a neural level, the sense of the narrative self is related to the default mode network or the singular gyrus, or the cortical midline here. And if we talk about meditation as one example of how we can other states of consciousness, we have to yeah, make some uh, distinction, some conceptual distinctions. And one is, if you want to say in a very, uh, in a very non-spiritual way, prosaic way, a definition of meditation would be training of attention regulation. Because you're sitting here and now and you're focusing on an individual object, which
which may, might be your breathing in and breathing out. So you're just focusing on this object. And in, let's say, mindfulness meditation, um, uh, yeah, med meditation uh, concepts, what, what you do is, through focusing on breathing in or doing a body scan, you're letting go of thoughts. Because you're so much focused on your individual object of your body, that you lose the sense of the narrative self. If you take, for example, because you have to think about different variants of meditation techniques, of like mantra meditation, what is a mantra? It's a continuous silent reciting of a mantra, a holy word. So you repeat the same holy word, the same holy word, the same holy word, the same holy word, which of course has a meaning in the spiritual, religious context, but you repeat this word over and over again. Of course, what you do is again, suppressing your thoughts. So you're suppressing your um, narrative self. But since we are also in a quite Catholic area, similar to where I come from and from Bavaria, and so we always think about East Asian techniques, but just think about reciting the rosary. What is this? So you have, for example, this in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And you do this as a normal mantra, a Catholic mantra, where you again suppress your thoughts. So what you do actually with this is you have a loss of the narrative self over time. And in very experienced meditators, and could also be that we shown in non Catholic nuns, you have also then a loss of the bodily self. So your self goes away. And what I would want to show also the time goes away. So this was the uh, last question Can we be in a timeless state? And now I want to present you uh, excerpts of an interview with um, uh, a very experienced man. So Tilman Lundum Borden is actually a person from Freiburg who studied medicine finished his medicine degree, but then became, decided to become a monk, a Buddhist monk of the Tibetan tradition. And you see here, this is already five, six years ago, so he has more experience now. So he has 35 years of experience in meditation, he had then. He was for 21 years a Buddhist monk. And just imagine now what he did in meditation. For 10 years, he meditated 12 hours a day. So there's no Saturday, Sunday or anything, so for 12 years, every day, 12 hours. So I tried to calculate his experience, and it came to much more than 50,000 hours of meditation. And now what in this interview I did with him, did he say about self and time? That's, I think, very telling. The timeless awareness during meditation is an awakening. It has no beginning and no end. This timeless time is an immersion into a being where no comparing happens. When we are comparing, there are always relations between a before and after, so that's time. It is timeless presence without a sense of an eye without observer. Perception and perceiver are one. So that's actually what we call the non dual consciousness. So we see, actually, now in this experience, I think how. Uh, I guess that no one would ever reach this experience, experience in meditation, however hard we try. But there is a shortcut to have at least some experiences of a similar kind. And this, if you look at the floating tank, uh, I like to call this instant meditation. You know, floating tanks, you are in a tank with warm water, body temperature, exactly body temperature and it's full of salt, absolute salt, so you actually float in this water and you lose your sense of the distinction between self and outer self because of the body, of the body temperature of water. And of course at the beginning, and then there, you have a lid going on top of you, so at the beginning you have no external stimulation, you don't see anything, you don't hear anything, you don't smell anything, and at the beginning what remains is interception, you feel your inner self, and mind-wandering, you have your uh, inner thoughts, of course, and the beginning very strong of thoughts. What am I doing here? How long will this take? And so on. That is mind-wandering. But there's actually one study I can cite that prospectively, as one could expect, subjective time slows down for beginners of this procedure because they are totally focused on the interceptive self, and then time slows down. If you ask them, well, how is time at this moment? In the retrospective, when they come out, 
Because, remember my distinction prospective retrospective? Because nothing happened in the floating tank. There's no memories whatsoever, hardly any memories, not nothing really dramatic. So retrospectively, they totally underestimate duration, similar to what actually experienced meditators also say. Meditators with experience say a 30 minute meditation was like 5 minutes. And here they also totally dramatically underestimate the duration of their floating tank experience. So at the beginning we have body perception, self-perception, and time perception intensified, but later, through relaxation, you also get into the states of loss of sense of self and time. And actually, can, I'm a witness myself of this uh, state uh, as I conducted several studies, or several self-experience uh, immersion um, uh, experiences in the floating tank here with Justin Feinstein, with whom we are now conducting systematic studies to now uh, study subject and self-related um, uh, aspects. Um, one more um, aspect of altered states of consciousness. Of course, uh, in the last five to ten years, the study of psychedelics like LSD, psilocybin, and also ayahuasca uh, has totally increased. Now, suddenly, in countries like the US, in England, in Switzerland, uh, in Brazil, there are a lot of studies testing against psychedelics. And of course, it is in itself very interesting, and then um, we'll go into studies showing how it's also important uh, for, for psychopathology. Um, and what I want to show here is uh, related again to subjective self and time, how we can study now consciousness of time and self. So, if you, uh, Franz Vollenweiler group in Zurich, in the psychiatric hospital, they study, have studied over 400 to 500 subjects. And what you show when you test them afterwards, after they were, um, uh, after they experienced uh, intake of uh, uh, psilocybin, psychedelic compound, they, they report ego dissolution, dissolution of time, and the feeling of So, again, this correlation of self. There's an fMRI study by Katrin Keller, who's a colleague of uh, Franz Wollenweider, where she also sh showed that under an LSD, or I read now here, LSD induced a feeling of loosening of self boundaries, but was reflected in a reduced neural response to self versus other initiated real time social intervention. So you have a loss of self boundary and less self other distinction. So you become one with the world and one with the world. Um, here with ayahuasca, um, I should, you don't have to read everything that is on this slide. Most importantly, uh, uh, Israel uh, researcher Paul Shannon, he did a lot of studies with ayahuasca and he again shows that the peak experience of these psychedelics is that you have no sense of time and self. You know? Show for different parameters and different temporalities. Maybe look at the modified temporality at the right. Um, what all can happen below the level of no self and time, yeah, so cessation of time, modified rate of flow, confusion of order, and so on. So with ayahuasca, you actually have a means to again tap into processes uh, of time. Now, uh, the last chapter, so this was again, you could say, sort of basic research, because we're interested in time consciousness, self consciousness, and I could show now with different induction methods that through inducing other states of consciousness, sense of self and time can go away in extreme cases. But this is basic research, but we can go one further, um, that we actually can say that uh, other states of consciousness are also important for the understanding uh, of psychiatric symptoms. So psychiatric symptoms like depression, anxiety, substance dependence, I showed beforehand uh, the results of time perception. What is a common symptom in these psychiatric um, uh, syndromes? Increased self-focus and hyperactive default mode network, I showed you before, with, related to self-regulation. So you have increased self-focus on all levels, on the body itself and the narrative self. So a hyper-awareness of self and time is the signature of many um, psychiatric symptoms. And loss of connection with others, other people, other world. But what can I say? 
features of altered states of consciousness. Yeah? And these then counteract these psychiatric uh, symptoms. Because in altered states of consciousness, you have less awareness of self and time. And as we showed, more connection with other people and the world. So we can, and this is now clinical studies that are really con are conducted, uh, doing this, um, uh, trying to test this hypothesis that we can get a transformation from meditation, floating time, psychedelics, even video games, to be more absorbed, flexible, open, and relational and self-transcendent. I will now go very quickly, because I'll soon come to the end, um, to some slides just to show you how there are scientific studies now showing how through altered states of consciousness, psychiatric symptoms uh, can be uh, uh, attacked, attacked. So, mindfulness-based interventions shown, uh, have shown the most consi consistent evidence uh, for um, intervening in depression, pain, smoking addiction, and other addictions. So I just highlighted three um, headlines of um, uh, studies, which all consistently show that through mindfulness meditation, people can reduce the symptoms in these psychiatric uh, symptoms. I had shown you beforehand my, uh, the uh, work was of Justin Feinstein, my colleague in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and he now shows us the first of two already uh, published papers showing that uh, and in this case he had 50 patients with anxiety and stress related disorders and they had only one floating tank session and what they could show a significant reduction in all negative signs, stress, muscle tension, pain, depression, negative effect and significant improvements in relaxation, happiness and overall well-being in only one uh, floating tank. Of course, now they're continuing on with several sessions, eight sessions, and showing the before and after, also with what happens in the brain with fMRI technology. And this is now continuous work. But it just shows you now, with all these induction methods, how you can improve uh, the psychiatric symptoms. But also now with psychedelics, when you think this is like crazy hippie LSD stuff, no, it's also that. But um, it's also really now part of uh, clinical studies. So we have positive experimental trials assessing the anxiolytic, the antidepressive and anti-addictive effects of ayahuasca, psilocybin and LSD and very prominent in anxiety, in anxiety obsessive compulsive disorders but also major depressive disorders and dependence issues. You find that these other states of consciousness induced through these techniques uh, reduce the symptoms very strong. So this was a long way from uh, a awaiting time study yeah, with students in a in a room yeah, uh, where I want and then to fMRI research where I wanted to show how uh, the body itself is related to subjective time um, to other states of consciousness which I use as a method to gain <coughs> insights into how self and time, how consciousness uh, evolves and to these clinical studies, uh, how we can actually use this knowledge also in, in, uh, in medicine and in psychiatry and neurology. So my uh, nearly final slide is, or actually the final content related slide is, if you ask, so as a take home message, what is subjective time, the feeling of time? Yeah? It's all about momentary time, experienced self, body time, insular time, emotional time. And I wanted to show you that how time consciousness and self consciousness and bodily consciousness actually are all interrelated. And I thank you for this time.